Brandeis University uh, for her first lecture of three. Uh, and is this the title for all of them or for this? Yeah, one? all of them. Okay. okay. For hyperbolically embedded subgroups in acylindrically hyperbolic groups. Great. So thank you to the organizers for having me here and giving a mini course. Um, so I'm going to talk for all three days about hyperbolically embedded subgroups and acylindrically hyperbolic groups. And the general plan is that today I'm going to give you some definitions and basic examples. Um, the second lecture, which is tomorrow, is going to give you sort of describe some of the, the standard tools using um, some of the standard tools that we use to study hyperbolically embedded subgroups and more generally groups that contain them. And then on the last day, I'm going to give you uh, a whole sort of list of examples of sample applications of sort of show you the power of having hyperbolically embedded subgroups. So let me start with just some basic notation. Um, so I'm generally going to be thinking of a group G that will be generated by a set S. So this is a group. And for most of what I talk about today, the set S does not need to be finitely generated. So I'm going to talk a lot about infinite generating sets of groups. And if there's any point where I require the set to be finite, I'll explicitly say so. And when we have any generating set, I'm going to use this notation to be the word length with respect to the generating set S. And then I'll use D sub S to be the word metric. So that just means that D sub S, if I kept two elements of the group, G and H, this is the word length of the element G inverse eight, H written with the alphabet S. Okay, and then I'm going to use the sort of standard notation, capital gamma of G comma S for the Cayley graph of G with respect to the generating set S, which might be infinite again. Um, and I didn't say this at the beginning, but feel free to stop me with questions at any point. Um, okay, so let's start by, okay, so I want to define both hyperbolically embedded subgroups and acylindrically hyperbolic groups. I'm going to start by defining acylindrically hyperbolic groups. These are groups that have a particular type of action on a hyperbolic metric space, and that type of action is called acylindrical, which is where the name comes from. So let's start by defining an acylindrical action of a group G on a metric space X is called acylindrical if for all epsilon greater than or equal to zero, there exist constants R and N greater than or equal to zero, such that for every pair of points X and Y in the space X who, that are at least R apart, the number of group elements that move both X and y by at most epsilon. So the distance from x to gx is at most epsilon, and the distance from y to gy is at most epsilon. The number of group elements that satisfy that is uniformly bounded by n. Okay, this is not the most straightforward definition, but here's a picture. If we're in the space x, I want to take two points x and y, and um, I'm going to say that these two points are at least R apart. And it doesn't really matter, but you should think of R as big and epsilon as small, sort of have this make intuitive sense. And I'm going to draw the epsilon ball around both X and Y. So a ball of radius epsilon here, a ball of radius epsilon there. And if this action is acylindrical, then for all but N elements of the group, so for almost every element of the group, if the image of Y is contained in the epsilon ball around Y, then the image of X is not contained in the epsilon ball around X. So if one point is moved just a little bit, points that are far away should be moved a lot by the same group element, right? Um, there can be finitely many elements that sort of quasi-stabilize both, move just X, X and Y by a little bit, but only n of them. And n is independent of the choice of x and y. Okay, so you can think of this as sort of a properness condition on um, g acting on the space x cross x minus a thick diagonal. So it's sort of like properness on pairs of points in the space, except you require that the pairs of points are far apart. So that's the minus the thick diagonal part of it. So what are some examples of acylindrical actions. Okay, well, there's some sort of trivial examples. So if you have a group, any group, 
then its action on a point will be asylindrical, right? And the reason is simply that if you look at this definition, I need to be able to find two points in the space whose distance is at least r apart. So set r greater than or equal to zero, no two points exist, and the definition is vacuously satisfied. By the exact same reasoning, any group acting on a bounded diameter space is acylindrical. For any epsilon, I just choose r greater than the diameter of the space. Again, the definition is vacuously satisfied. OK, so there's some sort of trivial examples. Um, more generally, anytime you have an action that is both proper and co-bounded, this implies that the action is acylindrical. So proper co-bounded actions are acylindrical. On the other hand, there it is possible to have a proper action that is not acylindrical. Okay, so these two examples, it's sort of like an example and a possible non-example, I'm leaving as exercises for the problem session. So both of these, the first one is just sort of a, an exercise in applying the definition of proper co-bounded and acylindrical. And the second one is a little bit harder because you have to think of a proper action that's not acylindrical. But the idea here is that um, proper actions don't have this notion of uniformity. So you're moving from sort of a non-uniform definition of an action to a uniform definition of an action. So one shouldn't imply the other. So that's sort of a hint for the problem session. Okay. Um, also, I should say proper co-bounded actions, that's the kind of action that a group admits on its Cayley graph with respect to a finite generating set, right? So actions of a group on Cayley graphs with respect to finite gener generating sets are acylindrical. So another example is if you take a non-exceptional mapping class group, um, it will admit an acylindrical action on the curve graph. What does one exceptional mean? One second. Um, and this is due to Bowditch. So almost every mapping class group is non-exceptional. So the exceptional mapping class groups are when so you have a surface of genus G with P punctures. And so there's like a small list of mapping class groups, which are when there's no genus and zero, one, or two punctures, zero, one, or two, or three punctures will be the exceptional mapping class groups. So like the small surfaces. Um, so this is really almost every mapping class group. As soon as your surface has sufficient complexity, so then the exceptional one, sorry, is, is, is not true or is it unknown? Uh, I guess it depends. Not true. It's always known. Sometimes, yeah. So not true. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I never think about exceptional mapping class groups. So like in my mind, all mapping class groups are non-exceptional. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So this definition. So this proof is due to Bowditch, and actually this formulation of the definition of acylindricity is due to Bowditch to exactly describe the action of the mapping class group on the curve graph. So it's not important for this talk what the mapping class group is or what the curve graph is. So if these are not familiar to you, you can just take it as black boxes. But um, this is sort of the one prototypical example of an acylindrical action on what turns out to be a hyperbolic graph, which is due to Mazur and Minsky. Okay, and another example is if you have a group that is the amalgamated product of H and K over a subgroup A, or an H and N extension of H by A, where the subgroup A is malnormal in G, then this group has an acylindrical action on a tree which is the Basser tree associated with the split A. Um, so in this case, G, the action of G on the Basser tree is acylindrical. And here, what it means for A to be malnormal in G, um, this means that if you take A and you conjugate it by an element G, and then you intersect that conjugate with A itself, that this is empty for every element of the group that's not in A. So this is empty. Um, well, it's not empty, it's trivial. For all elements G in G minus A. 
Okay, so again, I'm not going to go into details of the example, but it, um, if you have a group that has a splitting like this, then that group naturally acts on a tree, which is a hyperbolic space, um, and that tree, the action on that tree is acylindrical in these cases. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so let's suppose that we have a group and it has an acylindrical action on a hyperbolic space. So suppose G acting on X is an acylindrical action on a hyperbolic space X, uh, then exactly one of the following occurs. Okay, so the first possibility is that the group G has bounded orbits. And in this case, the action of G on X is called elliptic. Okay, the second possibility is that there exists an infinite order element little g in the group, um, which is finite index in the group. So the index of g, the index of little g in big G is finite. Okay, and this happens, this is the same as the group being virtually cyclic. So it has a finite index cyclic subgroup. So those are sort of the two less interesting possibilities, or less interesting things that can happen when you have an acylindrical action on a hyperbolic space. And the third possibility is the more interesting one. Okay, so the third possibility. Can you add even more? Can I raise it? Yeah. Is it just that side where there, that's the problem from the desk? Yeah. Is that, okay. I'll try to be mindful of that for the rest of the talk. Okay, the third possibility is that there exists infinitely many independent loxodromic isometries or loxodromic elements. Okay, so what does it mean for an element of the group to be a loxodromic element? This is gonna come up again and again in the study of acylindrically hyperbolic groups and hyperbolically embedded subgroups. So an element G and G is loxodromic with respect to an action of the group on some space, let's say a hyperbolic space, if uh, the map from the integers to the space defined by n maps to g to the n x for some little x in x is a quasi-isometric embedding. Okay, so intuitively what this means is that this element little g acts as translation along some axis in the space. And you can, it won't necessarily be a geodesic axis, but it'll be some quasi geodesic axis. So if you have your space X, then there's gonna be some, I'm gonna draw it as a geodesic, some by infinite quasi geodesic and your group element little g just translates the whole space along there. So if you take some little x that's on that axis, then g is just gonna move it continually along that path kind of out to infinity, right? So these are, first of all, they're infinite order elements, right? So for this to be a QI embedding, these have to be infinite order elements and they act as translation in the space. And generally speaking, at least in acylindrical actions, these are the dynamically interesting elements in the action. So you either have Bounded orbits, so the action is elliptic, meaning there are no loxodromic elements, right? These elements don't have bounded orbits. Or the group itself is virtually cyclic, in which case we sort of understand the group well. Or not only do we have one loxodromic, but we actually have infinitely many loxodromic elements. And these loxodromic elements are uh, independent. They're, they're independent, right? So like we're always, if we have one loxodromic element, we'll always have infinitely many because every power of a loxodromic is loxodromic. Those are not independent. So what it means for two loxodromics to be independent, well, if you think of this axis that they translate along, it defines two points at infinity. There's a point sort of that you get to if you iterate G in the positive direction, which is sometimes called G plus infinity and a point that you get to if you iterate G in the negative direction, so negative powers of G, so like G minus infinity. And two loxodromics are independent if they're those two points at infinity that they define 
are disjoint sets. So H and G are independent loxodromic elements if H plus infinity, H minus infinity intersect G plus infinity, G minus infinity is empty. So these are like loxodromics. Here's one. One that might be independent is something that translates in this direction, right? The axes are just, just pointing totally different directions. They don't share either endpoint. Um, this third case, the action, this acylindrical action is called non-elementary. While the first two cases, one and two, are elementary, elementary actions. Okay, so we're ready to define an acylindrically hyperbolic group. So a group G is acylindrically hyperbolic, which I will probably never write again and just abbreviate to AH if it admits a non-elementary acylindrical action on a hyperbolic space. So what are some examples of acylindrically hyperbolic groups? These are the groups that we'll be thinking about for this whole mini course. So the first example is any non-elementary hyperbolic group is acylindrically hyperbolic. And you can see this from its action on a Cayley graph with respect to a finite generating set. So I know you haven't had the hyperbolic groups boot camp yet. This is a little bit too early, but um, a group is hyperbolic if a Cayley graph with respect to some finite generating set is hyperbolic. And if it's true for one, it'll be true for any finite generating set by what Jacob said in the first talk about quasi-isometry invariance of hyperbolicity. So a hyperbolic group will have a hyperbolic Cayley graph and the action of the group on the Cayley graph is proper co-compact. And so in particular, it's acylindrical. Now, non-elementary rules out those two bad cases. So a hyperbolic group is elementary if it's finite or virtually cyclic, right? So in the non-elementary hyperbolic groups, we'll have non-elementary acylindrical actions on their Cayley graphs. Okay, another example is non-elementary relatively hyperbolic groups. So I'm gonna say even less about those. Those, I guess, will be mentioned a little bit at the boot camp. Uh, Francois Damani is going to speak about them a little bit later this afternoon as well. And these have acylindrical actions on their coned off Cayley graph, sometimes called a relative Cayley graph, sometimes called electrified Cayley graph. There's a lot of different options. Okay. Um, in my list of acylindrical actions from over here, I said that non-exceptional mapping class groups acting on the curve graph is acylindrical. The curve graph is a hyperbolic metric space, and these non-exceptional mapping class groups will have non-elementary acylindrical actions on those curve graphs. So non-exceptional mapping class groups are acylindrically hyperbolic. Okay, and this is coming from the action on the curve graph. Um, the outer automorphism group of a free group is acylindrically hyperbolic when n is at least two. If you have a group acting on a proper cat zero space and it contains a rank one isometry and G is not virtually cyclic, then this is acylindrically hyperbolic. This class includes um, right angled Artin groups and right angled Toxeter groups. As long as they don't split as products with two infinite factors, so non-directly decomposable right-angled Artin and Coxeter groups um, that are not virtually cyclic, right? So most right-angled Artin and Coxeter groups are acylindrically hyperbolic. Uh, many fundamental groups of three manifolds are acylindrically hyperbolic. So there's a precise statement here. If you take the fundamental group of a three manifold, then one of three things happens. Um, they're virtually solvable, they're acylindrically hyperbolic, or you can quotient by a normal cyclic subgroup and get an acylindrically hyperbolic quotient. So this is many in not like a mathematically precise sense, but there is a precise statement that you can make here. 
And then there's lots of other examples. So um, groups of deficiency, at least two are acylindrically hyperbolic. So that's any group which you can, which has a presentation with at least two more generators than relators in the presentation is acylindrically hyperbolic. So that's pretty broad. Um, the Cremona group is acylindrically hyperbolic. That's the group of birational maps of the projective plane. That's an acylindrically hyperbolic group. So these sort of show up in lots of different places. So I'm just gonna write uh, many more. So there's tons of examples coming from all different areas of math. Okay, so these are acylindrically hyperbolic groups. That's the first half of the title. And the second half of the title is hyperbolically embedded subgroups. So let me talk about those. Um, and before I define them, I'm actually gonna state a theorem saying why I'm defining acylindrically hyperbolic groups and hyperbolically embedded subgroups in the same talk because they're gonna feel very distinct. And the reason is, um, so this is due to OSIN, for any group G, the following are equivalent. So first, G is acylindrically hyperbolic. And second, G contains a non-degenerate hyperbolically embedded. So these hyperbolically embedded subgroups give an equivalent characterization of acylindrical hyperbolicity that is not in terms of actions of the group on a hyperbolic space. Okay, so what are they? So defining them takes some work. So I cannot just write down the definition of a hyperbolically embedded subgroup, unfortunately. So hyperbolically embedded subgroups are difficult to define in general and kind of weird to think about, but it turns out they're a very powerful tool for studying acylindrically hyperbolic groups. And they're a tool that are gonna allow us to turn sort of, you know, acylindrical hyperbolicity is kind of a dynamical criterion and a geometric criterion. You're looking at actions on hyperbolic spaces. Hyperbolically embedded subgroups allow us to turn geometric and dynamical questions into combinatorial questions about paths in Cayley graphs. So they're defined using paths in Cayley graphs. So let's say that we have um, a subgroup H of G, and we have some subset S of G. So here H is a subgroup and S is a subset so that G is generated by S union H. Okay, so S itself doesn't have to generate G, but if you add it to H, that'll be a generating set. S could be infinite or finite, it doesn't matter. Um, and we say that S is a relative generating set of G with respect to H. Okay, then I'm gonna consider a Cayley graph which I'm just gonna call gamma, and that's gonna be the Cayley graph of G with respect to S disjoint union H, okay? So this is the relative Cayley graph. So what does it mean here that there's, this is a disjoint union? This is actually gonna be really important in applications. So here, we're not assuming that the intersection of H and S is empty. It might be. Um, so I guess it's not necessarily empty. And if there is an element that is in both S and in H, the fact that this is a disjoint union means that in the Cayley graph, we're gonna put two edges between those vertices. So if we have some element G and we have some element H and maybe G inverse H is in both S and H, then we're gonna put two edges one where we're gonna think of this as G inverse H in S, and one where we're gonna think of it as uh, G inverse H in H, right? So it's the same label, it's the same element, but one we think of as an element of the set S and one we think of this as a cell element of the set H, okay? Um, so whenever you have a relative Cayley graph like this, because every element of H is included in the generating set that you chose for this Cayley graph, this Cayley graph contains the complete graph on the subgroup H. So gamma sub H, which is gamma of H with respect to H, um, is a subgroup, a subset of gamma, where here this is the complete graph. 
right? So every pair of points in H are connected by an edge because all of H is in the generating set. What I'm gonna do is use this Cayley graph gamma to define a metric on H. And it's gonna be called the relative metric. And it's actually gonna be an extended metric so it can take the value infinity, but we're not gonna worry much about that. So this is going to be called D hat. it will go from H cross H to zero infinity inclusive on both sides. And it'll be defined as D hat of F comma G is, so it's the minimum of L of P. So L is standing for length here. So this is the length of some path P. And the requirements on P is that P is a path in gamma from F to G such that P does not contain any edges from this complete subgraph gamma H, okay? I'm gonna draw a picture of this. I'll draw a picture of this in a minute. Um, and this is gonna happen if such a path P exists. Okay, so if we can find a path P from F to G, the two points here, that doesn't contain any edges in the complete subgraph on H that is a subgraph of gamma, then the length of the shortest such path is going to be the distance from F to G. And it's going to be infinity if no such path exists. So the definition of a hyperbolically embedded subgroup has to do with this relative metric D hat, which I'm gonna write down the definition and then draw a bunch of pictures um, illustrating this. So the subgroup H is hyperbolically embedded in G with respect to S. And we write H hook arrow sub H of G comma S if two different conditions hold. So the first condition is that the graph gamma, which is the Cayley graph of G with respect to S disjoint union H is hyperbolic. So delta hyperbolic for some delta. And second is that if we look at H and we consider it with the D hat metric, this relative metric we just defined, that this is proper. So what does that mean? Um, so if we just think of the discrete case, so we're, this is like a finitely generated group or some countable group, this means that uh, balls of finite radius in H are finite. So they contain finitely many elements of H. And here the radius of the balls is being measured with this relative metric, not with a word metric on H. Okay, so this is kind of weird, right? Like this is not, this is not in any way like, I don't know. Like it turns out it's very natural, but a priori it's not very natural. Like why on earth this D hat metric, where does this come from? So let's draw some pictures and do some examples of hyperbolically embedded subgroups and ones that aren't hyperbolically embedded as well. Um, okay, so also one more thing before I give examples. You could do all of this with a collection of subgroups, like script H, H1, H2, H3, finite or infinitely many. And you could define all of this. A collection of subgroups can be hyperbolically embedded. You can have D hat metrics for each of the subgroups in the collection. Everything I say will be true for at least a finite collection, um, but I'm not gonna get into any of that technicality because it just involves adding subscripts everywhere and just makes things a little more complicated. So I'm gonna focus on one hyperbolically embedded subgroup. Let's talk about examples. So the zeroth examples, this is gonna be a pair of examples and these are the degenerate cases, but they're actually quite useful for understanding this definition and what the D hat metric is. Okay, so the first degenerate case is, so for any group G, if we choose as our subgroup, the entire group, then the entire group is hyperbolically embedded into itself with respect to the empty set. So the relative generating set, we don't, we don't need anything, right? So the group itself generates the group. Um, so 
Why are these two conditions true? So first, our graph gamma, this is now the graph of G with respect to G. So this has diameter one, every pair of points is connected by an edge. So this is bounded, so it's hyperbolic, right? Uh, and what about the D hat metric? So here, gamma sub H is gamma, right? Gamma sub H is the complete subgraph on vertices of H, H is G, gamma is the complete sub the complete graph on elements of G. Um, so if we're trying to define this D hat metric, if I take any two points in H, which is just the group, then I'm looking for a path in gamma that does not contain edges from gamma H, but gamma is gamma H, right? So no such path will exist in this case. Any path will contain edges of gamma H. So this implies that D hat of F comma G is infinity for all F G in G, which is H. Can I ask a silly pedantic question? Yeah. Zero or infinity distance? Zero. So you could take the empty path as a path and it doesn't contain any edges of gamma H. Yeah. Good pedantic question. Um, okay, so here H with respect to the D hat metric is proper because there are no balls of finite radius. So the definition is vacuously satisfied. Okay, so that's the first degenerate example. Um, maybe the second degenerate example is when for any group, you choose a finite subgroup. So if you take a finite subgroup of any group, then that finite subgroup hyperbolically embeds in the group where the relative generating set is the entire group, right? So this should be like the opposite case of when the subgroup is everything. Here, the subgroup is essentially nothing, but the relative generating set is everything, okay? So again, we have a gamma, is gamma of G comma G. But now the fact that this G shows up here in gamma is because that it's equal to S in the definition rather than be, being equal to H in the definition. So this is hyperbolic. And then it doesn't even matter what the D hat metric is in this case, but since H is finite, if you take any metric on H, there will only be finitely many elements in any ball right, because there's only finitely many elements of H itself, right? We can't have infinitely many elements of H in a ball if there aren't infinitely many elements. So this says H comma D hat is proper. Okay, so these are the degenerate cases. So I said the theorem was that you're acylindrically hyperbolic if and only if you have a non-degenerate hyperbolically embedded subgroup. These are not the type that we're thinking about because every group has such hyperbolically embedded subgroups. These are kind of the equivalent or like the analog of, in some ways, um, the fact that a group acting on a bounded diameter set, any group is always acylindrical, right? You always have these degenerate hyperbolically embedded subgroups, so it doesn't tell you anything at all about the group. Okay, what are some more complicated examples? Okay, so the first example of a hyperbolically embedded subgroup is the free product of Z with Z. So in this case, the first Z factor, I'm gonna think of as my subgroup H, and I'm gonna let T be the generator of the second Z factor. So in this situation, the subgroup H hyperbolically embeds in G with respect to the relative generating set that is just the single element T. So this entire first Z factor and the generator of the second factor generate the entire group, right? So here S is little t. Okay, so now we need to check these two conditions and it's a little bit more complicated to do so. So we need to figure out what this relative Cayley graph looks like. So what happens to the Cayley graph of this, or what happens to like the group G when we add in as our generating set, the element T in the entire subgroup H. So um, this is sort of like what Jacob was talking about. This isn't quite an electrification, but since this entire subgroup H is gonna be part of the generating set for gamma, H itself is going to have bounded diameter. It's gonna be a diameter one subset. There'll be edges between every pair of elements, um, but this T will move us out of H in different directions. So I'm gonna have, here is my gamma H. So it's bounded diameter, complete graph on H. 
And then for every vertex in gamma of H, I'm going to have an edge labeled by T coming out of it and an edge labeled by T going into it. So I'm going to draw a couple of them. These will all be labeled by T. And then I'm going to have uh, translates of this complete subgraph gamma H at the end of each of those vertices. So this would be like T gamma H. I'm not going to label all of them, but this is like H T gamma H, et cetera. So I'm going to have these. They're, they correspond to cosets of H, but in the graph setting, they're translates of the complete graph gamma sub H. And then the same picture is gonna continue. And the fact that um, this is a free product says that there are no relations between T and any element of H, which means that this is going to be like the, the pattern here of these complete subgraphs is going to be a tree-like picture. Because if you could start in gamma H and there was some loop that got you back to another point in gamma H, um, that would tell you a relation between T and H, T and some elements of H, and that doesn't exist in the free product. So this space, which is gamma, this is quasi-isometric to a tree. So in particular, it's hyperbolic. So the first condition is satisfied. And now for the second condition, we're thinking about paths in this space between elements of, between vertices in gamma sub H. So if I just draw this gamma sub H a little bit bigger, so just kind of zooming in on this part of the picture, what I'm interested in is when I have two elements in gamma H, so here's F and here's G, and I want to have a path from F to G in this Cayley graph that doesn't contain any edges of gamma H. So that means that um, I have to first, the first edge I take has to leave gamma H. Right? And I can't re-enter gamma H like with an edge until I get back over to G. I could pass through it like with a vertex and go out again, but I can't stay in it for an edge. And that, it turns out, is impossible, right? Because I have a tree pattern here, right? So if I leave, if I take any path out of F, I choose any an edge here leaving, for example, then the only way to get, the only thing I can do to get to any other point of gamma H is to re-enter gamma H at F. Right? Otherwise I've formed a loop and that's never gonna happen in this free product structure. Does that make sense? So what this says is that in fact, uh, for all F G in H, uh, D hat of F comma G is infinity. No paths like this exist, so we're in this second case. So that means that in this situation, there are, are no balls of finite radius in H with respect to the D hat metric. So finite radius balls are finite. There are no finite radius balls. This is trivially satisfied. So this shows that H does hyperbolically embed into G with respect to T. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I didn't. And in fact, Am I going to state it now? Exercise for the problem session. So this is one of the problems for the problem session is that if G is a free product of H and K for some groups H and K, then the subgroup H hyperbolically embeds in G. And what this means is that there is some relative generating set S so that H hyperbolically embeds in G with respect to S. So the key point of this exercise is find the S. For this particular example, when H and K are both Zs, I gave you the S, right? And checked it. So here it's saying find the S. Yeah, so this is one particular case of a much more general statement. So let's look at a non-example. So if yeah. I think S could just be a, a generating set for G, mm -hmm. D hat is the same as the increased set for H. You uh, so if you take S could be a whole generating set for G. Okay. And the D hat on H is the Oh, so the like, disjoint union. So the disjoint union, so if that generating set for G, contains a generating set for H, then um, this D hat metric, well, so the problem is that like H could be a priori distorted, 
right? So like if, if H is undistorted in the group, then you, and the generating set, you took a finite generating set for G that contained a generating set for H, then you would get the, like in do, you would just get the D hat would be a generating set of H with respect to the finite subset of S that generates it. And there's sort of some more complicated things that can happen, but it turns out that in general, um, regardless of what S is, and I'm gonna talk about this in the next lecture, there is a finite subset of H so that uh, the word metric on H with respect to that finite subset is by Lipschitz equivalent to D hat. So if in particular H is finitely generated, then you will always can find a generating set for H um, that is bounded above by the D hat metric, where the reason you need bounded above is because of what you don't know what happens when it's infinity, when D hat is infinity. So there definitely are some connections that you can make. Um, but one other thing to say is that the groups G and the subgroups H don't have to be finitely generated themselves, which is one reason that some things are stated in this full generality. So there might not be a finite generating set of H. There might not be a word metric there that you would think of in the traditional sense. Yeah. So, so you, you included the generator of both factors that are generating sets, say like P and S. Mm -hmm. So S generates, little s generates H. Then D hat is the K that you're going to want like Yeah, that's right. Yeah, And we'll do some of those examples in the next lecture. OK, so I have three minutes. I want to give you a non-example that's sort of the opposite of this. So let's say that G is the direct sum of Z and Z. So here, this first factor again is going to be H. The second factor is going to be T. Then in this case, H does not hyperbolically embed in G with respect to T. Okay, so this is gonna be a non-example. And let me go through this a little bit faster. I wanna do the same thing here. I want to um, draw the, re the relative Cayley graph here. And so I'm not gonna get this tree structure because now um, H conjugated by T is H again, right? Because T and H commute. So what I'm gonna get is this complete subgraph gamma H. And for every vertex, I'm gonna have edges labeled by T entering and exiting. But now, I'm not going to get distinct copies of gamma H at the end of each of those T edges. So this is going to be T gamma H, and then I'll have T squared gamma H, et cetera. So this gamma is going to be quasi-isometric to a line. So it's hyperbolic. But the difference in this case is the D hat metric. So now if I take any two points, F and G, that are in H, the D hat metric from F to G is at most three. So here's the path. I start with some element F here. I can take a T edge to move to a different copy of gamma H. This copy of gamma H is a complete graph and I'm allowed to use all of its edges. So I can take a single edge to jump to wherever point is above G. So this is like just one edge in gamma H. And then I can take a T edge back down. Right? And I say less than or equal to three because if, F, if G is F, then it's zero, right? So in this case, H is infinite. So the ball of radius three in the D hat metric contains all of H. So it's not finite. So this implies that H D hat is not a proper space. Does that make sense? Okay, so what I want to do at the yeah question. Can we make an example with an amalgamated free product? Yeah, so you can make examples with amalgamated free product, and it's going to be kind of like um, you're going to need to have some conditions on what you're amalgamating over, and it depends a little bit on which H, like which subgroup you're choosing. Okay, that's right. So, like, if you, for example, if you amalgamated over something that is malnormal then you would get the same situation. Now, what is the 
So it's going to look like the best SARE tree with respect to the splitting, yeah. depending a little bit on exactly how you choose your generating set. So some subtleties, but it's going to look like the essentially like the best SARE tree with respect to the splitting. Um, if this is a Z, then like this, this, like this is the best, essentially the best SARE tree with respect to this particular splitting. I've just blown up the vertices labeled by cosets of Z to these complete graphs. So the same kind of picture would happen. You'll have a bath stair tree associated to the amalgamated splitting. Um, and I guess maybe you would need to include in this relative generating set what you're amalgamating over. Maybe you'd have to kind of work out a little bit exactly what the relative generating set is, but it's gonna look like a bath stair tree, It'll be quasi-isometric to it. Yeah. Technically to extend S. Well, so the Cayley graph that I'm using is S disjoint union H. So I have all of H when I'm drawing this graph and then just T. With respect to S. Yeah, so S is just the single element. It's the relative generating. This one up here? No, and it doesn't need to be an S. It just needs to be a path in gamma which has the generating set H union S. And the only condition is if I fix this complete graph, the path can't contain any H edges in this particular coset. It contains an H edge. It can contain any H edges that are not in gamma H. Yeah, so you can, can use any edges in any translate except this original one, which is one of the reasons that it seems so tricky, right? Like if you can use some H edges, but not other H edges. Yeah, good question though. Mm -hmm. Could you say a few words about the connection between this T hat metric and the electrification that uh, Jacob talked about? So, uh, can I say a few words about it? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, the it's not quite the D hat metric, but what you're doing, the way this connects to electrification, is you look at this disconnected Cayley graph. So, the Cayley graph of G with respect to S but S is not necessarily a generating set of the group. So that might be a disconnected space. And then you electrify that space over the subgroup H. So you take your uh, Jacobs collection curly Y of subsets is the set of cosets of H, right? And for each coset, you make a complete graph. So that's sort of the connection between electrification. I don't know that that, I mean, that, um, and so Jacob said that if you start with a hyperbolic space and you have a collection of quasi-convex subspaces, the electrification gives you another hyperbolic space. Here, you're not starting with a hyperbolic space. You're not even starting with a connected graph. And one of the conditions on being hyperbolically embedded is that this electrification is hyperbolic, right? So you're making some stronger assumptions here than what Jacob said. Um, so, I mean, that's really the connection with electrification. The, when you, so like what Jacob was talking about with guessing geodesics and you're looking at geodesics and the electrification, you know, these, these paths that you use to define D hat are not going to be geodesics anywhere in the original space or in the electrification, because you're requiring that you don't, that often at least you don't take the most efficient route or that you never take the most efficient route because these are all distance one from each other. Um, so there's relations with building this space, but I don't off the top of my head see a direct relation with the D hat metric itself. Okay, so maybe I'll say that what I want my plan next time is to give you some tools that you use for hyper, for a, with hyperbolically embedded subgroups. They sort of come with some nice tools. And I wanna show you why having a non-degenerate hyperbolically embedded subgroup is equivalent to being acylindrically hyperbolic. So this talk is like two disjoint things. And I want to explain why they're not actually disjoint, why they're equal next time. Thanks. Um, there were really some questions. Maybe let's have one more question. So like, uh, I, I'm not sure, but I can simply, I similar to the Olson definition on like gravity. Ah, yes. Okay. So I did not say this today. I was going to say at the beginning next time, but, um, a, you can take this as the definition of a relatively hyperbolic group since you have not had the relatively hyperbolic groups boot camp and have not seen Francois talk this afternoon yet. Um, a group is, a gr the group G is hyperbolic relative to H if and only if H hyperbolically embeds into G with respect to a finite relative generating set S. So this is an example, S is finite. This Z factor, uh, 
a G is hyperbolic relative to this subgroup H. So there is a very strong connection to relative hyperbolicity, which I'll explore in a little more depth um, in the later talks. And these hyperbolically embedded subgroups are in some sense, a generalization of peripheral subgroups in a relatively hyperbolic group. So they're generalizing to this larger class of groups. Some relatively hyperbolic groups are acylindrically hyperbolic if they're non-elementary, but this is a much larger class of groups. And this is the analog of a peripheral subgroup. But it does not look like the definition of a relatively hyperbolic group unless you took your definition from OSIN. <laughs> so there is like, there's lots of different definitions of relative hyperbolicity. And one of them due to OSIN is reminiscent of this, but not exactly this. Good question. <laughs>